Hello, watch enthusiasts. Now, today I'd like to talk about the the origins and the evolution of the Tudor Submariner, and this is to better understand the manner in which the Tudor Black Bay, a watch which has of course taken the market by storm in in recent years since its inception in 2012, to better understand the the various characteristics of this watch and the origins of these designs. The origins of this watch start in 1954 with the reference 7922. This was a model which mirrored the Rolex Submariner very very closely. Apart from that, they used a, uh, a Fleurier movement with uh, with a, a frequency of 18,000 beats per hour. And of course, this is quite low by modern modern standards, but it was a very reliable movement. Of course, it wasn't in-house like the Rolex one, but, uh, but nonetheless, it offered a, um, a slightly less expensive alternative to the, to, to, the, to the Rolex. This dive watch comes in a very simple and basic format. It has the, the simple bi-directional five-minute bezel um, with those five-minute increments, which is a simple painted bezel insert. It then does also have no date, and it's a very simple loomed layout on the dial, with those typical uh, Rolex-style Mercedes hands. Underneath that beautifully domed acrylic crystal and uh, an elegantly lacquered dial with those gold indices, one also notices that this watch is only water-resistant to 100 metres. Now that was the standard for the time, and was also the case with the contemporary Rolex Submariner, as the step up from this watch. Of course, this watch was presented on that typical Rolex riveted bracelet, in this case the Oyster bracelet, which was of course the, the staple really for the Rolex sports watch line, and, uh, and in this case was, was moved over to the Tudor line as well. The 1955 reference 7923 was, I believe, from Tudor's perspective, a, a, um, uh, an experiment in seeing how far from the Rolex Tudor could get before the watch wasn't as functional. And here they really did take a lot away from the original. Here the hands were turned into these baton-style hands, which weren't as legible, um, though they are very elegant. And also there's that lollipop-style second hand with the, uh, the loom pip right on the end of the hand. Also, the whole case is made much, much thinner due to the fact that it has a manually wound ETA movement rather than a, an automatic calibre. Another very obvious difference between this and its predecessor was the fact that it had these straight bars between the lugs rather than having solid um, uh, or complete end links, rather because in this case it would, it would render strap and bracelet changes quicker, um, but I suppose did remove from the, the quality of the watch. The text on the dial of this watch also became much, much simpler due to the reduced features. Now only Oyster was inscribed beneath Tudor in the, in the place of Oyster Perpetual due to the fact that it's no longer automatic, but equally the Submariner um, and uh, shock-resistant um, writing on, the, on this dial do replace the... Uh, the the, the rotor uh, winding text on the previous models and on, on later models. And this was, of course, due to the reduced features and due to the fact that this watch um, uh, was still a, a Submariner, but just a, a, a greatly reduced model. I feel the first Tudor Submariner, though, that really did pull into its own was the 7924. And this was released in 1958, and this featured a much thicker case, still retaining that 37mm cross-section, but nonetheless was far, uh, I think, beefier would perhaps be the, the, the right term, and this was, of course, known as the Big Crown. So this had a, a larger 8mm crown, and, uh, and was again um, uh, self-winding, so automatic. The water resistance has also been doubled to 200 metres, as has the thickness of the case. Of course, the functionality of this larger crown really was helpful, because with the thicker case it was much easier to grip this crown to change the time and to wind the watch manually if it was needed. This also did protect the crown a little bit more and gave it a, a great deal more strength and stability. Um, and though it jutted out further, it did uh, it did provide itself with with uh, with resistance. Otherwise, the bezel changed slightly as well. It was now graduated from zero to fifteen rather than at, at five minute intervals all the way round. Of course, this has become a, a standard really in the dive watch community, and was of course following on from Rolex's innovations. But nonetheless, is an interesting addition to this uh, this Tudor dive watch. The dial was also finished in a similar way. Um, and of course, though those um, those hands did return uh, with the the, the Mercedes style our, our hand and uh, and the larger second hand, adding to it a better legibility and rendering the watch a, a far more suitable dive watch. In this model, the 390 caliber was reintroduced as as it was in the 1954 model, thus making this watch again automatic and uh, and altogether more practical for a diver. In 1959. The square crown guard 7928 marked the end of the, the sort of romantic era of Tudor Submariners. Now I call this the romantic era because it was the era when these watches weren't, weren't really um, 
uh, as functionally considered as later models. So they still retained uh, bits of, uh, of, of old-fashioned flair, which, which I, I think is very appealing. But from then on, these watches became very much professional instruments. So here we see the, the 7928, and this is a very interesting uh, evolution, really, of the original. Because here we see a 6mm crown with, with these squared-off crown guards, which provide a great protection for the crown and, uh, and avoid shocks underwater. In addition to this, the entire case has been resized at 39mm, which is quite small by, by today's standards, but nonetheless was, uh, was much larger than the original, and the reason for this was down to those thickened lugs, which, uh, which really are very clear when one looks at this watch. They also feature more pronounced bevels along their edges, which do as to add to a, a very aesthetically pleasing watch. The hands were also sharpened and, and I think, better sized than, than, the, than the big crown version, um, with the second hand being a tad more in proportion with the others. The bezel is also a real change here, where much larger teeth have been incorporated into the bezel, which face up at a sort of 45 degree angle, rather than the original uh, coin edge, which, uh, which gives better grip on the bezel underwater with gloved hands. Of course, this watch retained the 390 caliber movement of, of the original, really, um, due to its functionality and, and due to its reliability in this watch. It is also worth noting that this watch did retain some of the classical cues of the original, um, notably the, uh, the, the drilled lugs, which, which are a very practical offering, I suppose, from Tudor, uh, and certainly do add to the practicality of this watch for changing straps and bracelets quickly and easily. This also was very much uh, a, a feature of a tool watch, which needed this sort of functionality, in, instead of the, the aesthetically pleasing nature of having these smooth, continuous, polished surfaces. The 7928 was then updated in 1960 with the pointed crown guard version. And this version was quite an interesting reference, because I think it really did, did um, influence the, the design of the Tudor Pelagos, uh, a recent uh, titanium diver of theirs with these pointed crown guards which, uh, which reach this, this sharp point, which I don't think provide the same sort of resistance and, and protection as the, the squared off crown guards, but probably are more comfortable on the wrist uh, for, for long periods of time, and won't dig into the, uh, the, the wearer's wrist. This retained the dimensions of the 7928 um, at the, that 39mm diameter. Some adjustments were made though to the dial and the hands, where the hands actually um, uh, were again changed in terms of proportions, where the second hand, uh, uh, the second hand's loom pip, was again augmented to make it more legible. Of course, it's worth pointing out that the 7928 also featured the riveted Rolex bracelet, um, which was branded Rolex um, uh, rather than Tudor, and that was the case until the late 90s with all Tudors. In 1964, the rounded crown guard version of the 7928 was released, and this version really was uh, sort of a, uh, a milestone for Tudor because they found the crown guard design that would, would, uh, would really they'd retain until the 90s, and, and in fact until the very end of the Tudor Submariner. Now this watch was, again, in terms of its specs, very much a 7928 with the 39mm case, 200m water resistance, and, uh, and similar features and legibility. Also, this, uh, this version did feature hands which didn't quite have the same gold tone as the original, um, which were toned down a little bit to make the whole watch look a little bit more professional. But the main peculiarity about this watch from the 1964 line was that paint was used on the bezel and the dial that would discolour very easily with, uh, with UV. So as a result, you'd get these, um, these, these rich blue bezels and, uh, and, and brown dials, which of course are referred to as tropical dials and, and bezels. Um, and this is the case on a great deal of different watches. But in this case, these, this reference has become particularly known for it. It's bizarre really, that these watches are sought after, but uh, I suppose interesting nonetheless. That, uh, that a dial that's actually been damaged would be worth more than the original one. In 1967, the final version of the Tudor 7928 was released, and this was an interesting watch because it, it marked the departure, really, from the original Tudor um, and uh, the, the original Tudor Submariner, I suppose, because this featured the, a dial which looks far more modern and uh, resembles modern uh, Rolex Submariners far more closely, because it no longer has that ring around the edge of the dial, um, but rather has these free-sitting uh, indicators of, of seconds or minutes. Also, the hands are, are simple silver, they're no longer gilded, and, and this watch becomes a much more uh, austere sort of diver, and a watch which is designed purely fit for purpose, and not as a, a dress accessory, for example. In 1969, two versions of the, the Tudor Submariner were released, and both of these featured the, the new snowflake hands and, and dials and the no-date version was the 716, and the date version was the 721. Now the differences here were, of course, the hands were far more bold. They had this square form, 
and uh, and contained altogether more loom. Equally, the dials were designed to uh, to provide uh, more loom space and also to look slightly different to the Rolex offerings, without those uh, those standard um, those standard style Submariner dials. Here you had these squares dotted around the dial, which gave fantastic legibility in the dark. Also, the, the case was slightly redesigned and a new bracelet was, was given, which had new folded links rather than the original uh, riveted links, which had been seen for the last few years. Also, the, the manner in which the date was displayed on the date version was new too. Here, the, the various numbers were staggered between red and, uh, and black text, to give a, a more uh, a more clear look, and also this did become a, a real icon, has been seen now on the left-hand drive version of the Pelagos, which is certainly a very interesting interesting watch. These watches also featured a brand new movement from ETA, and this was the the, the two four eight series of of movements, depending on the date or the no date version. And this was the first real update to the movement since the thirty nine um, or three hundred ninety caliber, which had been used for the past few years since its inception. And this offered a uh, well better accuracy and better reliability in a more modern movement. In 1975, the 9401 was released, and this was a watch which I think has become the definitive Tudor Submariner, especially the Tudor, Tudor Snowflake Submariner. And this is because this was the first time this watch was available with the blue dial and the blue bezel, uh, as well as the black versions, and was certainly an interesting model. This also did uh, did add to that uh, that very real difference between the Tudor and the Rolex in terms of its aesthetics, uh, because of course this was seen as as a lower tier watch to the Rolex uh, Submariner, but here they were they were moving away in terms of styling very very clearly. Also, the choice of movement was changed. Now it's an ETA two seven seven six, and uh, this was the predecessor really of the two eight two four, and this was an interesting movement because it uh, it certainly was. An update, but again, it was uh, staying with the ETA line, which was something which uh, w which Tudor had had really stuck to for the f past few years, and cement that uh, that incorporation between Tudor and ETA. However, if anything, I feel that this uh, this blue dial and, and real change from the Rolex style was somewhat contradictory, and the reason why the other version of this watch never caught on that well, and very very few were sold, or at least they're very very difficult to find these days. And these are the versions with Mercedes hands. And these versions cost uh, generally more because they're more difficult to find of this particular reference. And these are Mercedes-handed version of these watches um, with the original Rolex-style dial in black or blue. And I think because people used to swing towards the Tudor snowflake hands, they didn't buy these. So they're remarkably difficult to find these days. Now this reference actually lasted 14 years, and, and that's a very long time considering there weren't any updates to this watch or any real updates to this watch in that time. I think that really is a testament to how well made and how well designed this watch was, with its, its more modern style of crown, which was a more simple shape to grip. It also featured uh, better fitting end links, uh, slightly adjusted case proportions, and, and again retained that high, highly grippable and, and easily manoeuvrable bezel. I think that another reason why this watch became such a success and lasted so long was the fact that it now incorporated the flip lock style clasp, which was more secure. Um, and uh, and allowed for less uh, less less fear of loss of the watch. It also now featured a dive extension for people who wanted to wear this over a wetsuit, which was again a very practical feature and a helpful one for someone who's going to be using this watch for diving. In 1989, after 14 years of the heyday of the uh, of the 9401, the, the 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 Rolex brand and and Tudor decided to make the 79090, and this was a real return to the sort of Rolex style that Tudor had always followed. And in my opinion, was a bit of a shame because I think this this detracted really from the the beauty and the uh, the originality of the of the the Tudor sub. The case of this watch remained thirty nine millimeters and the water resistance two hundred meters, but the hands were changed now to to the original Mercedes styles of hands. Also, the Cyclops was incorporated uh, back into the watch um, in new format. In addition to this, the bezel became much more similar to the to the Submariner with finer numerals and um, and finer text altogether. The dial was also altered with these uh, these tooth style, um, as I uh, as I like to say, dials. And here the the triangles were placed all around the dial, so at twelve, nine, and uh, and six, um, and I imagine would have been placed if there was a no date version at three. I think this is a bit of a shame though, because I always liked the fact that you could do, you could uh, determine where the twelve o'clock of the, the watch was without it on your wrist. That said, though, it can't be denied that these watches were really impeccably made and beautifully finished. 
Also, the dials were, were less cluttered than previous models, um, with the simple 200 meters, 660 feet, and then Submariner, um, which, which really does remove a lot of text from the dial, and, and as, as many know, I do like uncluttered dials. This design featured its, uh, its final incarnation in 1995, where the dial was refined for the final time uh, before the Tudor Submariner became a thing of the past. And, and this was a sad reference, I think, because it was very much the end of, of an era. Um, of course, one wouldn't have known that at the time, but nonetheless, it was, uh, it, it's a shame to see. Um, but here, the, 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 all, everything was refined, really. The, the case shape was refined slightly to make it sharper and more aesthetically pleasing. Also, the dial now featured uh, uh, rims around the applied indices um, to give the whole watch a more luxurious look. Also, in, uh, in 1997, the, the polished bezels were introduced, uh, which certainly were an interesting touch and, uh, and did change the look of this watch quite substantially. However, I think the biggest change was the fact that the, the, uh, the, the bracelets were now solid. Um, their clasps were still the sort of classic, quite, uh, quite flimsy clasps, but the bracelets themselves were solid, which did give the whole bracelet uh, a great deal more heft and made the whole watch feel more substantial on the wrist. Also, this watch did retain those, um, those, uh, the, those pushpin holes on the sides of the case to, to, to allow for easier change of bracelets, which was a clear and direct reference back to the original version of this watch. Also, the crystal was now sapphire rather than the plexiglass, which had always been really the case with the Tudor Submariner. But it was nice to see a real change in the, the manner in which the crystal was made to make it more durable on a daily basis. Anyway, I'll end on a picture of this wonderful Tudor Submariner from the heyday in that, that blue colour, um, with a, a heavily aged dial and bezel. But I'd like to, to thank Tudor's website for this video, because they, they really have proved invaluable in terms of the information they provide. Um, and really have done a fantastic job of, of encapsulating their history, which gives a great deal of information and means that uh, one doesn't have to search for quite as much as, as with other brands. Anyway, do please leave your comments as to which is your favourite Tudor Submariner reference in the comments down below. So thank you very much for watching. Do please like, share and subscribe if you did enjoy this video and would like to see more on the channel and more content. So thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy, over and out.